Welcome and thank you for joining RCR Wireless News today for our webinar on the connected car. I'm Kelly Hill, technology reporter for RCR and your moderator today. Let me go ahead and introduce the rest of our participants today. Uh, for As our analyst, we have Jennifer Kent, who is Director of Research at Parks Associates. We're also joined by Brian Greaves, Director of Product Development for IoT Solutions at AT&T. And we also have with us Craig Hendricks, Senior Wireless Business Development Manager at Enritsu, as well as Michael Givens, who is Senior Solutions Marketing Manager at Ixia. So welcome all, and uh, we're going to go ahead and start off with some of the recent news in the connected car market. Um, on the security side, we had some researchers announce a secure CAN bus with encryption, uh, which could go a long way to uh, developing some of the security needs on the connected car side. Um, we had uh, the U.S. House uh, talking about legislation for vehicle data privacy uh, and the FTC weighing in with concerns about uh, where to draw the lines for consumer protection as far as data retention, uh, best practice development, as well as some concerns about um, you know, allowing researchers uh, yeah, sufficient access to data while also protect, protect, protecting the connected car from hackers, uh, which is definitely something that's top of mind in the industry right now. Um, there's a lot of research going on right now. We also had some word this week about security researchers using Wi-Fi snippers uh, to track vehicles uh, via the, uh, the Vita-X, which is a vehicle-to-infrastructure or infrastructure or vehicle to vehicle communications um, using 802.11p, um, also known as DSRC, um, dedicated short-range uh, communications. Um, it's also of note that the connected car, there's going to be a connected car expo um, next month at the LA Auto Show, and so I think we should expect to see some interesting announcements coming out of that event as well uh, as one of the major uh, auto industry events of the year. And uh, with that, uh, RCR has its connected car special report available now at rcrwireless.com for free download. Um, some of the key takeaways from that report uh, include that the connected car concept covers a wide range of wireless technologies, architectures, and use cases. Um, integration is a key area of focus, and uh, the fact that simulation is and will continue to be at the heart of connected car testing. Um, on the consumer side, consumers are increasingly aware of and interested in connected car options, although at this point in the ecosystem development, uh, there's still a lot of reliance on smartphones inside vehicles. Um, as far as new technologies and requirements, some of those are coming online. DSRC is mentioned, uh, as well as eCall in Europe and, uh, and a version in Russia as well. Coming online now, being required in the near future, uh, that, will, that are greatly impacting uh, capabilities and testing, as well as regulatory requirements. Um, security is top of mind, absolutely as the reality becomes clearer that connectivity become, brings security vulnerabilities with it um, and that some wireless technologies are simply more secure than others. Uh, and testing and monitoring as well as the ability to quickly identify and respond to novel threats is going to be crucial for vehicle OEMs, mobile network operators, and suppliers. So you can read more in uh, that special report that's available at, for download at rcrwireless.com. And with that, uh, we are going to move into uh, presentations from our participants, starting with Jennifer Kent of Parks Associates. Jennifer? Thanks, Kelly. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to set the scene a bit for the connected car market uh, generally as we dive into this, this really interesting topic. So I think it's, it's nice to remember that the connected car market um, is among the most established of all of the IoT markets. Um, and you can move to the next slide. Um, the, the auto OEMs, the mobile network operators, and all of their suppliers and, and tech enablers have actually, you know, several decades of telematics experience under their belts at this point, both from a fleet management and product tracking, commercial use case side, as well as uh, consumer telematics. So GM's OnStar product, for instance, you know, came out all the way back in the 1990s. Um, We've also seen very early buy-in on the value of connectivity from device manufacturers in the auto space compared with device manufacturers in other parts of the IoT, especially consumer IoT. So for instance, door lock manufacturers in the smart home space or um, glucometer manufacturers in the digital health space are just now sort of getting up to speed and getting their, their products to market. 
and really understanding the value of that connectivity. So audio OEMs um, and their partners certainly understand that um, connectivity in the vehicle expands the relationship with the consumer beyond the sale. Um, it provides greater insight into maintenance issues and very valuable insight into possible recall issues and the ability to get ahead of those things. Um, that being said, due to long uh, product development cycles as well as sort of an uh, inability to innovate uh, quickly in this very tech-heavy um, type, type uh, market, auto OEMs have been slower to implement some of these um, uh, new technologies uh, compared with some of these other device manufacturers. I'll get into that again in a bit. Um, that being said, we are seeing growing consumer adoption. We are pushing beyond the early adopter phase for sure here in the, in the connected car space. Uh, Park Associates estimates that about 16% of cars in the U.S. or about 41 million light vehicles will be internet connected by the end of 2015. And of course, millions upon millions more are internet capable, um, but the, the drivers may have not decided to opt in um, to the, the programs or the subscriptions or whatever might be necessary to make that an, an active internet connection. And we see this percent about doubling within the next uh, five, four or five years, so that by the end of 2019, about 90 million light vehicles we expect to be connected. That being said, um, on the next slide, you'll see that you know major market challenges. And the one that's probably still you know the most talked about and perhaps one of the most challenging to address, as well as the most impactful for our topics today of security, interference, um, and testing issues is that connectivity methods in the connected car are not simplifying, they're actually multiplying. So um, compared with a relative, comparatively simple um, telematics phase where you had a uh, embedded cellular module, we now have the embedded approach. We also have a bring your own connectivity approach where you can pair your smartphone to the vehicle and, and access connected features that way. Uh, there are also um, aftermarket approaches that seem to be multiplying uh, by the by the month, um, where you can have an aftermarket dongle or head unit installed that comes with its own connectivity. Um, and each of those connectivity methods um, have sort of a ripple effect of challenges. And of course, the, the three that I mentioned, you know, bring internet within the vehicle. But then there's also several other layers of, of connectivity standards. Um, that the auto OEMs and their partners have to manage within the vehicle, whether it be Bluetooth or an in-vehicle Wi-Fi hotspot or also near-field communications, perhaps. So there's the, the um, challenges are multiplying as the connectivity methods multiply. Um, so, so each of these connectivity methods brings with it sort of a um, assumed business model. Um, an assumed uh, different player that would dominate the user experience or would capture the, the most potential value um, for that connectivity method. And it's been a real sticking point, a real method, or a real point of, of confusion and, and sort of uh, limitation on how fast this market is moving because there's a lot of confusion out there as to, as to how best to bring these connected services to consumers. Um, with multiple connectivity methods, we also get into user experience experience inconsistencies, especially if you think about it from the user's perspective within one family, you may have multiple vehicles and different ways that you're connecting within the vehicle, and is that really the, the experience that we want for our consumers? Um, there's certainly a big challenge to incumbents right now from those outside the auto ecosystem, most notably the tech giants from Apple and, and uh, Android as well. And of course, my, my colleagues here today will speak more to the technical testing, design challenges, but also security issues um, that are raised by, by uh, connected vehicles. I also wanted to just uh, take a, a moment to bring the consumer perspective um, to our listeners to set the scene of, of what activities are actually engaging in, in the vehicle and by what connectivity method they're doing so today. So in the next slide, you'll see that um, we tested several different activities or apps that are, are performed or accessed in the vehicle, and um, this could be by any um, excuse me any connectivity method. So just using your smartphone directly as you're driving down the road, making voice or or uh, receiving voice calls, or actually using an embedded navigation system, for instance. Um, making voice calls and navigation do score quite highly, while some of the uh, newer 
applications like in-vehicle Wi-Fi hotspot, parking finder apps um, are still have, have relatively low usage in the vehicle. And at the moment, um, on the next slide, we took an aggregate view of the uh, <clears throat> ways in which consumers are interacting with these activities and apps in the vehicle. And uh, overwhelmingly, consumers are just using their smartphone directly. So they are just picking up the vehicle and making that call or sending that text message as they drive down the road. And I think for all of us in this industry, or who happen to have to drive down the road, that's a pretty scary proposition when it comes to distracted driving. Um, 3 in 10 did report um, accessing at least one connectivity, uh, connected activity or app through an embedded or tethered connect, connected car method. So again, not using their smartphone directly, but using the, the types of capabilities that the auto OEMs and the smartphone manufacturers are, are trying to move to. And finally, we asked, OK, well, what about your next vehicle? So when you are looking, uh, evaluating your next vehicle to purchase, how would you prefer to interact with these types of activities? or applications in the future. And overwhelmingly, it's, it's not the current situation. So consumers do not want to use that smartphone directly. They're interested in an, an uh, a experience that's built, built directly into the vehicle, and also certainly open to an experience of linking their phone to their car. And of course, this is an aggregated view, and it differs by specific activity or specific app. Um, from our perspective, we see the most likely situation going forward is that there will be a hybrid approach where consumers will be able to access some, ve some features through the built-in um, capabilities in their vehicles as well as other features through a, a tethered approach. But that, again, brings up more testing, security, and interference issues. So I'm looking very, very much forward to uh, the other panelists and, and how they propose to deal with those issues. Okay. Great. <clears throat> Well, and, uh, and of course, the technology development is driven uh, in part by demand. Um, now we'll be hearing from Brian Greaves of AT&T uh, on AT&T's Drive Studio and uh, how AT&T is tackling the connected car. Brian? Yeah, good afternoon. So yeah, today I'm going to discuss with you a little bit about how AT&T is reshaping the connected vehicle space in quite a few ways. So if you want to click to the next slide. Um, AT&T is focusing on quite a few different areas. Uh, from once we early began working with automotive manufacturers, many manufacturers would come to us and really ask for basic also data, connectivity. I know I need to get a connection into my vehicle. That's, that's often changing now as we work and kind of collaborate with these manufacturers more and more. They're saying, I need to do more. I need to be kind of the first to market or at least a fast follower in this space because a lot of my cars and trucks that I'm selling, some of the things that really differentiate these services that I'm bringing to market are in the connected vehicle space, so I need to be a leader in that space. But what at and is really doing is transforming uh, the connected vehicle to mobilize life. And what I mean by that is really changing the way in which a customer will interact with, with their vehicle and the other devices that they bring to and from their vehicle to create more of a connected lifestyle. Specifically in the connected car, uh, I'm going to discuss three different areas in which AT&T is focusing. If you want to click to that next slide. First and foremost, AT&T is focusing on safety, and safety first, and, that, and safety uh, ha has a couple different caveats. We look at uh, safety from uh, the standpoint of disabling or um, uh, limiting uh, any potential for hacks or potential hacks into the vehicle um, and those connected car services associated with uh, potential hacking. Uh, also, customer data and the privacy of that data, making sure that we um, uh, we, we keep that, that customer data private and that we're not sharing any data um, uh, with any outside partners or if we are, we're making sure that we're anonymizing that data that uh, the customers choose to share. And then uh, probably first and foremost in, in, uh, in addressing the biggest industry uh, issue is uh, reducing distracted driving concerns. Those are growing uh, exponentially every day. So what we're really working with this is to see how do we provide connected car services but doing that in a safe and reliable manner. We're also focusing on convenience, making it easier for customers to relate and stay connected while behind the wheel, um, and doing that in, in multiple ways. Everything from um, integrating into your home security uh, and home automation services to uh, wearables and other broadened devices. 
And then lastly, focusing on entertainment, and that's primarily for your rear seat or passenger um, uh, entertainment, and that's focusing on uh, services like broad, you know, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi hotspot support for broad-end devices, other um, infotainment, so uh, streaming audio, streaming video type services uh, to and from your vehicle as well. So as we look, if you want to click to the next slide, as we look uh, to how AT&T is focusing or on the industry, we're focusing on in four main areas. Um, embedded, which is basically um, factory fit services that we uh, put into production vehicles. The aftermarket space that can be OBD or onboard diagnostics uh, dongles uh, that we put into vehicles, as well as um, uh, aftermarket stereos and, and head units for vehicles. Also in the fleet and rental space, obviously fleet customers, that's a huge growing industry and a huge um, area of importance and focus as more and more of these fleet companies look to connect the, the, the cars and trucks that they have on the road. And then the, the UBI, which is usage-based insurance space, um, focusing on services very similar to the snapshot, uh, understanding, hey, what are your driving uh, patterns and making sure that they um, create policies uh, ac uh, according to those driving behaviors. So jumping into that and, and focusing, if you want to click to that next slide, uh, specifically in the embedded space, you can see connected car growth is growing substantially. Um, from the dark purple, you can see those are global connected car shift um, uh, currently in the projections out through 2020. In the light purple, you'll see is, uh, is, is kind of projections on car ship with connectivity. You can see the ratio is going to greatly uh, increase from where we're at in 2015 uh, to where we're going to be at in, in 2020 as 75% of the shares, 75% uh, of cars that are shipped, not only in the U.S., but worldwide will have some type of connectivity. And AT&T is working with manufacturers not just for the U.S. and North America, but creating solutions for um, uh, global connected services worldwide. If you want to click to the next one. Um, and we're, we've been fairly successful in this space. Um, right now we currently have 5.8 million connected cars um, that we're working with various manufacturers on. Nine of the top 15 automotive manufacturers that are out there we have agreements with or we're currently either working uh, uh, from a connectivity standpoint or bringing other services into those uh, in those vehicles. And by 2017, we, we plan to have uh, 10 million vehicles connected on our network, um, uh, on the AT&T network. And we are the first carrier with a de dedicated connected car facility, um, which is the AT&T Drive Studio, and I'll get to in a second. If you want to click to the next one. Really, AT&T is focusing on several different uh, differentiating areas, but I'm just going to mention a couple here. Obviously, the biggest one being our network and our strongest 4G, 4G LTE signal. Um, also creating unique billing solutions uh, for our customers, the bill ability to split out bills and different, do different bill on behalf um, services for the manufacturers and partners that we work with. As I talked about, we're focusing on global solutions, so that includes our global SIM solution. and how, Because every manufacturer that we talk to is thinking globally, we want to make sure that we support that. And then obviously uh, focusing on services on, on our AT&T Drive platform, which I'll jump into now on the next slide. Um, really, AT&T is focusing on moving connected car services into the cloud. While a lot of connected car services have been local, and your uh, a good example of that is, hey, you bought your car, maybe it's today or you know a couple years back. That experience is going to be the same throughout the life cycle of your vehicle. What we're doing is really making these platforms a lot more flexible by bringing these services off board and not having such a reliance on local um, hardware and local software. And we're doing that by really creating a cloud-driven experience with our AT&T Drive platform into which we can offer various connected car services on various hardware, various uh, operating systems, um, and really create, obviously, a complete application and ecosystem for our, our partners uh, and developers. And if you click to the next slide, you can see a few different uh, examples of some of the services that AT&T is really uh, partnering with automotive manufacturers on. And that's everything from basic applications, like you'll see weather and parking and um, uh, urgently and some of the other ones, to uh, integrated home uh, automation services, connecting your car to your home, um, creating personalization so your car knows you versus your wife or husband, um, creating that unique bond to your dealership for, to, to improve CRM support uh, with X time. So these are just a few different examples of it, but examples in which AT&T is really bringing these services to light for manufacturers. And a lot of that is being done, if you want to click to the next slide, um, 
at our AT&T Drive Studio, which is a brand new facility that we built in Atlanta two years ago. Since our opening, we've had over 5,000 individuals come through our Drive Studio. We have quite a few events. We have on, uh, on average uh, two to three events here a day, um, but we're really trying to push for new connected car solutions for manufacturers, drive innovation, and bring new services to life. So that's that's a very broad scope, but uh, hopefully you have a better understanding of some of the things we're trying to, to help and, and improve the uh, industry on. Okay. Great. Thanks, Brian. Hopefully we can jump into that a little bit deeper and, and part of our Q&A. Um, by the way, participants, we will have a lengthy Q&A session once we're done with presentations. Uh, so please feel free to submit questions that you have uh, through the user interface and we'll get to as many of those as we can. And now we'll go to Craig Hendricks of Enritsu. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so uh, Enritsu is a global test equipment supplier. I've been in business over 100 years and we have a number of different solutions uh, for testing various types of communications. In the chart, you, the slide you see above here uh, at the top, in the cellular space in the upper left we have uh, uh, things like our 8475 that, that simulate the cellular network, all the different radio access technologies that can test e-call and handoff between all the different uh, technologies and cells, uh, major data throughput, test uh, voice over LTE, which is going to be coming to cars and, and so forth. Next to that we also have uh, similar um, network emulators that are for doing RF testing, the various RF parameters of the cellular protocols. Uh, we also have boxes for testing um, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, uh, both in a signaling mode um, that can be used for various uh, types of interference testing. Uh, as well as uh, products are used, uh, modular products are used in production. Uh, over in the lower left, we have we have products that are used for testing the Vita X 802.11p DSRC. Uh, we can also test the uh, tire pressure monitoring um, radio protocol uh, uh, RF parameters and the remote keyless entry. Um, over on the far right, we have a whole line of handheld instruments, spectrum analyzers, network analyzers, spectrum master. Site master, VNA master. These are these are used for not only troubleshooting the cellular base stations and networks, but uh, we sell these to auto manufacturers a lot of times for testing the cables and antennas in the cars. Um, and uh, we have systems for doing uh, direction finding on interfering signals uh, that'll help help point you to where the interferer is coming from. And down on the bottom, we have uh, products for testing uh, fiber optics in the car as well as in the lower right we have our uh, vector star that can test the millimeter wave uh, radars that are used for collision avoidance in the car. Uh, next slide. I'm going to um, take a moment and just expand a little bit on one of the products that I mentioned first in the last slide, our 8475 cellular network simulator. It's very popular with the auto manufacturers, the telemax vendors, module vendors, cellular carriers, automotive operating system vendors. It can support all the different uh, cellular protocols, uh, FDD and TDD LTE, uh, the 3G WCDMA, GSM, TDS CDMA from China, and CDMA EBDO like Sprint and Verizon use. Uh, we can set up in a single box, we can set up a, a two cell um, network. Uh, they can be two cells of the same technology or uh, two different technologies to do handovers and, and roaming scenarios and so forth. Uh, we've got software options for testing the European eCall and the Russian version of that called ERA GLONASS. We can test E911, uh, network time zone, uh, make sure that comes up uh, right on the device, uh, SIM testing, data throughput testing, um, battery drain, you know, when you turn the car off, does the radio go off or does it sit there and brain, uh, drain the battery of your car so when you come back your, your battery's dead. You need, need to test those kind of things, test Volti, uh, rich communications audio quality, SMS, MMS. Uh, we can test if the device or the car is being too aggressive with the network and trying to um, use up too much network resources when it's having trouble getting access. Uh, we can do reject testing at the layer 3 message at the, at the uh, APN and, and the IMS layer. We also have automation. It uh, comes with hundreds of test, example test cases and we can also automate from uh, other platforms, Python, C, Basic, LabVIEW, via either Ethernet, GPIB, or DLL function calls. Okay, great. All right, well, we uh, thank you for that. 
and I hope we can get more into interference issues and some of those other testing questions as we move into the Q&A session. Um, now we're going to move on to Michael Givens of Ixia. Thanks, Kelly. Hi. Um, Ixia is a company that network and security product companies have come to for almost 20 years to make sure their products were up to standards. We make hardware, software, and system applications run stronger both for today and tomorrow. Uh, next slide, please, Kelly. And what does that mean and how does it fit into the connected car market? Well, we provide the tools and capabilities organizations can use to test, visualize, and secure their networks so that their applications run stronger. As pioneers in the test industry, we have a long history of innovation, and we have to in order to provide the widest range of validation methods against the widest range of real-world events. As a premium partner in AutoSAR, ICSI has led the definition and creation of the conformance specifications that the automotive industry is now adhering to. In addition, our performance solutions include a full layer 2 through 7 range of support for the new broader reach technology being used. As was mentioned earlier, with the growing number of external access points becoming potential breach zones on the connected car, Ixia's security solutions can help verify the integrity of these systems. Ixia is an industry leader in security product tests, inline security frameworks, and network security resilience solutions. As the new networks that are the connected cars start to evolve, Visibility into these networks will be key in knowing that there are no issues or blind spots in these networks. You need real-time visibility for real-time intelligence, and Ixia is an industry leader in network visibility solutions. In the connected car realm, Ixia has partnered with multiple leading automotive test houses to partner our expertise in Ethernet technology with their expertise in automotive testing to provide the capabilities to ensure the connected cars are stable and secure. Next slide, please. And so connected cars require a complete ecosystem testing approach. That includes conformance testing to new standards and performance testing of all systems. It also includes security testing and ensuring the safety of both the automobile network and the user driving the vehicle. Lastly, dealers can no longer expect all of their vehicles to return home for updates. So remote updates and fixes will be a new way of delivering repairs and will have its own testing requirements. Thanks, Kelly. Back to you. Okay. Great. Um, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned over-the-air updates. I think we just had a very recent release from Tesla that actually, uh, you know, went out over the air and uh, included some automated driving features that uh, hadn't been available before. Automatic parking, um, uh, some automated driving uh, while cruise control is on. Uh, some really interesting stuff that just went out, I think, within the last uh, two weeks. So, um, so now uh, I want to make sure that uh, we start to get to some questions. Um, we, we always get the question of will slides be sent out, and uh, yes, they will. We will have a slide deck that's available uh, after the presentation. Um, and uh, I, I'm wondering if we can uh, jump back uh, to Jennifer for a moment and uh, and talk about um, some of the things that that you see. Um, as far as consumer education, um, and uh, you know, the, as we get more into this market, you know, as more capabilities become available, I think both you and Brian um, touched on, uh, you know, what consumers are doing now versus what they want to do in the future, uh, and how that, you know, really uh, factors into demand. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you think consumer education, you know, is going to ultimately make or break the success of the connected car? Sure, of course. I actually have a, a bit of a mixed perspective on this. From, from one perspective, I think that consumer, you know, the, the success of the connected car market is, is going to happen regardless of consumer education efforts to an extent. Consumer awareness, consumer comfort with new solutions and capabilities from, from all of the new technologies that we follow grows organically over time and, and is very responsive to uh, smartphone ownership. So awareness of um, awareness use and interest in um, connected car uh, activities and apps um, jumps significantly among smartphone users versus uh, you know feature phone or, or non-mobile phone users. And that speaks to how well actually the smartphone experience has um, really serve to educate consumers on what they can expect from their devices and has, has um, really taught them to, to ask more out of other devices besides smartphones. Um, so, so from one perspective, you know, I think it's going to happen without necessarily a, a huge push on, on very dedicated 
you know, um, education efforts from those involved. That being said, I think there's an enormous opportunity, especially for the auto manufacturers and also for, for the mobile network operators, to drive real engagement with connected car services um, and actual usage of the features by taking advantage of their retail spaces. So for the, for the um, auto industry, of course, when you're making that auto sale, um, there's a really great opportunity to provide consumer education on the spot, give them a tutorial, or perhaps later offer an, an online tutorial right there in the vehicle um, head unit to help consumers actually use these great functions, these new features that are being rolled out. Um, so I see that as more of a, an opportunity um, than necessarily a necessity for the success of the vehicle uh, of the connected car market to happen. Okay, great. Uh, Brian, we had a question for you, and th this came up when you and I uh, did the interview that was included in the special report, and so I wanted to address this question. Um, why is AT&T building a billing interface for the connected car, and what use cases can be enabled for end users by that? Um, I know that one of the things that we talked about was the role that services will play in the connected car. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about you know, why having that split billing capability is important and what kind of use cases uh, are enabled by that. Yeah, great question. So let me maybe break that down and explain that a little bit further. So what, when we talk about different billing solutions that were created for automotive manufacturers, when I speak to split billing, we often get the question from manufacturers that will ask us, hey, AT&T, I'd like to create have one single radio, one single SIM um, in, in my vehicles, obviously, uh, to, to reduce bill of material costs. However, I'd like to be able to split that same bill um, two ways. So if I am interested in diagnostics data to re-engineer and improve my vehicles, or I um, would like to do you know, firmware or software over the year updates to my car, I want to be able to do those, and I want to be able to pay for them. I want to be able to pay for that data usage. I don't, however, want to be paying for the customer who's streaming Pandora for three or four you know, hours a day. Can you split out those different billing solutions? You know, uh, can you create a solution for me to where you can split out those, that billing service for me and, cre and create a bill for me, the automotive manufacturer, and then another bill to the consumer? We're also creating other solutions uh, that are making it more flexible for customers to really ad uh, adopt new services and technologies. For example, um, adding your uh, your vehicle to your mobile data share plan. So if you know you have a family share plan, you want to add your car on for you know a certain ten twenty dollars a month. You can add your car onto that same billing plan, depending on what we uh, arrange with that that manufacturer. You also could do things like, hey, I'm going on a road trip, or and I want to add Wi-Fi hotspot because my my kids are in the back and they they want to connect their multiple devices. I want to turn that Wi-Fi hotspot on for maybe a week or a, a month or maybe the summer. Um, we, we want to create those unique billing situations and scenarios so that customers have the flexibility to add these to certain services based on their needs. Okay. Great. Um, let's dive into some of the technical questions that we're getting here. Um, we had one. We had someone ask. Uh, as you may know, the world is expecting 5G to be the future of wireless communications. Uh, 5G is definitely getting <laughs> a lot of attention right now, uh, as much as uh, it's largely theoretical in some instances. But uh, and saying, uh, you know, no one has mentioned the challenges of the, the millimeter wave frequencies and the solutions in terms of bandwidth they will offer to the connected vehicle uh, network. Now, um, I'm wondering if we can kind of address this in the topic, or in in the um, in the sense of, uh, you know, there are a lot of of technologies and uh, and uh, wireless. Um, uh, wireless access uh, technologies being used in the connected car now, um, uh, you know, 5G is, I think is an interesting question just because there are a lot of challenges in terms of millimeter wave when it comes to uh, you know propagation in the uh, as uh, as whether that would be you know how that would work for the connected car speed handovers etc. Um, does anybody want to want to talk a little bit about um, you know that aspect of uh, you know wireless communications and the connected car going forward. Uh, hi, this is Craig. I have a few comments. Yeah. Uh, in the millimeter wave space, um, in the coming years, we could see you know two possibilities uh, from a car. One is the 5G cellular, and the other is uh, there's a technology um, in 802.11 uh, AD technology, also known as YGIG 
up in, up at 60 gigahertz. Mm -hmm. And I was at an auto manufacturer recently, and I and uh, they told me they were interested in that. And I asked them about the use case, and they said that uh, it could be a use case where instead of having a red box where you have to remove a physical CD or DVD, you could get your car within 10 meters of the red box and download the video into the car within two seconds using something like Ygig. And it could be a similar kind of thing. From what I understand, for 5G, the uh, millimeter wave doesn't propagate as far, so it's going to be used in very dense areas, maybe small cells. So it could be a similar kind of thing. Um, perhaps the, uh, the red box could be using uh, the 5G millimeter wave instead of uh, the Ygig solution. So that's just some ideas I have and some things I've heard. Okay. Great. Um, we have a question that's directed to, uh, to Ixia and AT&T. Um, do you see uh, growing requirements from automakers to control the QoS from MNOs, um, or, or how can they ensure an SLA with MNOs? I think that gets a lot into network visibility as well as, um, you know, maybe even some of the big data and analytics that are related to the connected car. Um, any thoughts on that from, from either one of our participants? Sure, this is Michael. I'll, I'll give some feedback first, if you don't mind. Um, there are a lot of different systems in the car, and our approach to the testing is that it's a layered approach that you have to build from the bottom up. And so each individual system in the car needs to worry about how it can work to meet its own conformance requirements and performance requirements. And then you have to keep adding them together and keep testing to ensure that as you then build these systems upon systems in the Ethernet network that is your automobile, that they continue to perform and meet their quality of service requirements. So it's not just being able to test one system aspect and saying, well, that system's good, now I don't have to think about it. You have to build that car together and keep continually testing the overall product and, and ensure that they can meet the QoS needs that they'll have. Okay. Um, we have another question. Yeah. From you. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Brian. No worries. I was just going to add to that, and I, I agree. I, I mean, are we getting requirements for, uh, for, from from our manufacturers? Absolutely. But some of the the constraints that we have, and this kind of goes back to the even the question before that, is some of the other uh, constraints that we have is moving uh, a lot of these uh, solutions globally. I know we're talking about 5G, um, but um, believe it or not, it's it's hard enough to get a lot of these manufacturers moving from 3G to LTE. Yeah, you you do have a lot more. Uh, capabilities with LTE, um, but uh, there's also additional costs, and, and it's a very, uh, uh, the, the automotive industry is a, um, is a different industry to work with in which they uh, they definitely source a lot of the different the, from a lot of different suppliers uh, using a lot of the cheaper products that they have. So we have to deal with multiple bands in multiple different areas and really understanding yes that full end to end spectrum of uh, you know when you talked about some of the services in the, the connected car, what does that entire ecosystem look like? Security is another um, uh, piece of that. You can't just make sure that the security from the pipe is is, is secure. You have to really understand the whole thing from from everything. Uh, that you're building into the car, the vehicle infrastructure, all the way back through the pipe and, and to wherever you're connecting to. So we do have to look at those from an SLA standpoint. Okay. Um, we had another question come in that I think uh, I'd, I'd like uh, maybe Brian, Craig, and, uh, and also Michael uh, to maybe jump on. And that is, um, can you give an overview of a typical strategy for testing connected car solutions before they are launched to ensure proper operations on the commercial network? Now, I think all of you, all three of you come at uh, the testing uh, and strategy uh, perspective from a slightly different viewpoint. So, um, you know, Brian, maybe maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the basics of, of a typical strategy, um, you know, as you guys work on development questions at the Drive Studio. Is there a typical strategy? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so I think for, yeah, from a testing standpoint, obviously we're working uh, pretty much end to end with the automotive manufacturers uh, to, to understand what they're, which typically these modules that are put into these cars, they're built into these telematics control units, these TCUs. Understanding what the te the, the testing is like, obviously, uh, with very in various conditions. We do also a lot of road testing. There's a lot of road testing that that takes place because often you're not just testing in the city of Atlanta. You know, it's more of these remote areas. 
and uh, there's obviously a lot of different things you need to take into consideration antenna placement power gains uh, power limitations different bands different countries that support different bands things of that nature and we really work hand in hand with the automotive manufacturer the TCU manufacturer which is the telematch control unit and then other other factors as well whether they're you know putting in over the air updates and uh, maybe they're going to put you know a, a client in there um, other uh, module manufacturers could be like a serial wireless or a tellet um, we work with them the Qualcomm's of the world so um, we have we do quite a bit of testing out of here um, out of our AT&T drive studio we also have a dedicated um, we call it our, our network ready lab that uh, we also do quite a bit of testing on for not only the automotive space but also the kind of the internet of things okay um, Craig do you want to talk about uh, from Enritz's perspective how people are approaching the uh, testing for the connected car well, I think similar to what uh, uh, what Brian was just talking about, um, there's testing at at various stages. Uh, um, there's testing at the at the the chipset level um, by companies like Qualcomm. There's there's testing at the module level uh, by companies as Brian mentioned, Sierra Wireless, uh, Telet, uh, Ublox, uh, Jamalto, uh, and and there's and uh, at the at the chipset and and the, the module. And TCU level, those products will go through testing, uh, probably at a test lab, to do uh, regulatory testing uh, for the 3GPP, for example, testing and protocol and RF, and and uh, there's the uh, uh, CTIA uh, uh, over the air type testing that gets done when the device is is uh, is in its final, um, you know, placement, for example, in a car with, with the antennas that it, that it uses to make sure that all works. There's testing that goes on at the carriers, like uh, like Brian mentioned in AT&T's lab. So, uh, uh, and, and of course, there's testing that some testing, uh, some some auto manufacturers, depending on their, their um, uh, I guess, company policy or the way they operate, some, some, some of these auto manufacturers do some of the testing themselves and, and uh, some do more than others. Uh, some of them try to push all that off onto their vendors and some of them you know, try to uh, do more of that themselves. But uh, it takes place all, all along the, the food chain um, in, uh, at, at, at each, each level, the, the chip, the module, the TCU, the car, uh, the auto manufacturer, the, the TCU manufacturer, the module manufacturer, the carrier, uh, the test house, all those different places. Okay. Uh, Michael, your thoughts on uh, you know on on strategy and, and testing? Sure. I think uh, one aspect to point out that I, I don't believe has been touched on as much is that there are multiple standards bodies uh, being involved in this right now. So such as the IEEE, AutoSAR, Open, and Avnu, they're all developing different specifications that are becoming requirements in the automotive industry for some of these systems. And so it's not uh, you know as people mentioned you know testing at the different levels and all of that. It's not an ad hoc process that's going on inside of the industry. Um, they're, they're basically growing from the ground up all of the standards that they feel they need to meet, uh, especially when you talk about the safety systems within the car. Um, some of the time-sensitive networks have some really strict standards on how fast the information has to flow inside of the car network. And so there, there are some very strict standards coming out in those areas um, that are meeting those, you know, that allow the testing to meet those needs to ensure the, the safety of the vehicle. Okay, great. Um, Jennifer, I wanted to jump back to you uh, and talk a little bit about how this technology evolution fits into some of the larger trends that are going on in the industry. Um, you know, IoT, urbanization, uh, and I'm wondering how you see connected car kind of evolving as part of these uh, these mega trends that are driving uh, you know a lot of other areas as well. Sure. You know, I think that the, the connected car, if you, if you think about it, is a node in the larger IoT. And so um, it, it's not just any other node, though. It's a very influential node. It's one of the most valuable nodes. It's, it's, it's a, a device with an incredible number of sensors collecting data that's valuable to all other ecosystem players. Um, and it's also, from a consumer perspective, um, a point of connection between the home, between the workplace, uh, between the consumer and, the, and retail spaces, as well as infrastructure generally. Um, so what I'm seeing right now is uh, more forward-looking industry players are trying to craft um, their strategies for how to work with, with specific crossover use cases. So what, what does it mean when we um, 
have the car communicating to the home? What types of standards do we need to support? What types of services might be possible there? Um, what business models would surround that? So for instance, um, we're, we're looking very deeply into the crossover between the connected car and the connected home space and finding that um, uh, consumers are really interested in um, the ability to access their entertainment from their home DVR, for instance, on the road when they're going on for a vacation, or to have the vehicle communicate with the, their smart home devices and tell them when they're automatically away, set back the thermostat, lock the doors, that sort of thing. Um, and so I think that uh, what we're going to see in the next three to five years is um, a little bit more of a fleshing out from uh, both a technical perspective as well as a partnership business model perspective where these true crossover pieces uh, remain. And it, it's interesting because I think people think of the connected car space itself as being very um, emerging, um, but we're, we are quickly getting to a place where, um, you know, the, the uh, larger um, IoT market uh, is moving these issues will have to be addressed. Great. Um, we had another question on, is the growth of connected car uh, primarily in 2G, 3G, or LTE? Um, thoughts on that from our panelists? Yeah, I, I can maybe take a, the first stab at that. So uh, can it, the connected car growth primarily, I would say, kind of today and going forward is, is focused on LTE. Uh, and for the primary reason being is network longevity. Uh, most of the, these cars, uh, understand, understandably, when uh, let's just say uh, I were to, to, to make an agreement with a manufacturer today, it's going to be maybe about a two-year uh, time cycle until those vehicles hit the road, and then those vehicles are on the road for approximately of the life cycle of the vehicle would be about 10 years. So you're thinking about 10 year or, or 12 years out in total that those vehicles will be on the road. So you really need to be thinking LTE. While a lot of services don't require LTE services, most manufacturers are moving towards that. That being said, there's still quite a few um, manufacturers that have 3G services um, and are even still rolling out 3G. And there are a few that still um, have 2G services um, uh, as well. And as much as we talk about kind of the connected car market growing, please understand that the connected vehicle space is a very slow moving industry traditionally. They're moving much, much at a greater pace as of late, I would say the last you know five years, um, but it's still a very slow industry and for good reason. There's a long, there's a long, there's long cycles of, of testing and validation required into the rollout of a lot of these different technologies. So, um, it, you know, it's needed in this space. Okay, um, Michael, I wanted to come to you. Uh, we, we're getting quite a few questions on on various security-related issues. Um, you know, someone asking about uh, the the GPAC that was uh, that was published by Wired uh, in earlier this year. Um, you know, and uh, and some of these. Uh, the, you know these uh, the security concerns that are related to um, to the connected vehicle, uh, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about you know some of the things that are being to, done to test and secure um, the number of uh, internet connected technology entry points on the vehicle. This was something that came up over and over again uh, as I was researching this report. That you know IP connectivity brings with it a lot of wonderful things, uh, but it also brings some risks as well. Sure. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, there are, there are becoming way more entry points in um, than there were typically in the past. Uh, in the past, most of the entry points also were were very physical that you had to be with a vehicle, and now now you're not needing that. So so one of the things to think about it and look at it is the connected car really is becoming a little autonomous network that needs to be treated as any other network would, especially when it comes to security measures. And so that means the individual pieces inside of it need to be secure and on their own as well, but also the exterior and the filtering down through needs to be secure. So you test it from the multi-layer approach, right? You'll you'll test each individual system, make sure they don't get impacted by denial of service or other such attacks, and you also need to uh, ensure that malicious attempts to get in can be thwarted as well. So it's it's no different than if you were testing any other, you know, network that you would build um, really when it comes down to it. Okay. Great. Uh, Jennifer, did you want to chime in on that as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, we certainly see privacy and security issues being a, a huge 
um, issue among consumers that we speak to. Um, the majority tell us that they are very concerned, 55% say they're very concerned about the security of their location data, and 52% say they're very concerned about the security of their personal driving data, the type of data that might be collected for a usage-based insurance program, for instance. And to put that in, in context, that's about double the percent that tell us they're very concerned about internet-connected devices from other ecosystems. So when we ask um, about concern for privacy and security, about connecting a door lock even, which clearly has security, very real security um, implications, uh, only about 25% of consumers say they're very concerned about that internet connectivity. But when you talk about the car, um, it, it's seen as a, on a whole different playing field from consumers. Um, so, so there's no surprise that the GPAC is getting um, a lot of traction in the news. I mean, it's something that I expect to continue to, to see as this market develops. Okay. Um, Craig, I wanted to jump back to you. One of the things that I thought uh, your slides captured really well was the sheer number of, uh, of technologies that are going into the connected car. Um, you know, obviously, we have interference issues in wireless networks as it is, you know, for sm and, uh, and smartphones, we deal with that already. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, you know, as, uh, as part of this discussion, if you can talk a little bit about what some of the common sources are for interference in the connected car and how they were being addressed. Um, you know, it was, it was really interesting to me to have this conversation with folks over the course of, uh, of of the reporting for this uh, program, um, you know, there, there are some interesting quirks uh, of the connected car and uh, the connected car environment. I think that make it a little bit of a different animal in some ways than not than you know your smartphone or your tablet. Sometimes very different. 